Hey guys, I picked up a pretty cool new toy today. This is the NEC PC Engine GT. And basically what this is, is a portable PC Engine. Or of course, a portable TurboGrafx-16. Now this is the Japanese version, obviously, as it's called the PC Engine GT. But they also released this one in North America. It's called the Turbo Express over here. Now, unlike the TurboGrafx-16 and the PC Engine from Japan, um, you know, where they're completely different looking machines um, with, you know, the same insides, <clears throat> the PC Engine GT and the Turbo Express are basically identical. When you see it in pictures, uh, you know, just because of the layout and the dimensions, it really doesn't look like it's any bigger than a Game Boy. You know, an original brick Game Boy. The first time I saw this in person and I got my hands on it, oh well, I was quite surprised. This thing dwarfs the original Game Boy. You can see it's quite a bit taller than the original Game Boy. It's a fair bit wider. Not a lot, but it's a little bit wider. But it's definitely a lot thicker, as you can see there. So overall, it is quite a bit bigger than the uh, the uh, original brick Game Boy. And I always wondered how many batteries this thing ran off. I noticed what they've done is put six in a row. That gives you an idea how wide this thing is. Six AA batteries in a row. Now this thing was so far ahead of any other handheld that it's for its time. This thing came out in 1990. Okay, so that's a year after the original Game Boy. The original Game Boy launched for $89.99, under $100. Uh, the Game Gear launched for $149.99. So you know, $60 more for the Game Gear. You're getting the color, color backlit screen and everything. The PC Engine, or the uh, Turbo Express, launched in the U.S. for MSRP was $249.99. Unfortunately, most stores didn't even sell it for $249.99 for the first little while. This thing sold for $299.99. Now eventually it dropped down to $249.99, and in 1992 it dropped down to $199.99. So it was a very expensive machine compared to even the Game Gear. Um, but there's a reason why this is so much more expensive. The screen on this is amazing. And I remember reading advertisements back in the day for this machine, and they always talked about how the screen didn't blur when things moved. You know, even the original black and white Game Boy is guilty of that. And on the Game Gear, it's nice that you're getting a color backlit screen, and, you know, it was pretty good for the time, but we look at it now and reali we realize how blurry that screen is, um, especially when stuff's moving. When stuff's moving on the screen, it does get pretty blurry. Uh, and also, it's, it's kind of washed out, you know. The white uh, backlight really does come through and kind of washes out all the colors. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of blurry. It's not, you know, pixel sharp or anything. It kind of all just blends together. Which is fine. You know, back in the early 90s, we just figured that was normal. You know, having a color, you know, backlit screen in a handheld device in the early 90s was, you know, pretty high tech. The screen on this is an active matrix LCD screen. Unlike the Game Gear, which is passive. And the links. And they all have blurry motion. The active LCD screen on this thing is crystal clear it's very sharp you can see every single pixel pixel perfect and there's no blurring motion when it moves so there is a reason why this was so expensive and that's because its screen was just so far beyond anything else at the time one of the first you know handheld devices to have an active matrix uh, backlit LCD screen and uh, you know, there's really no blur at all when this thing moves. Uh, so taking a look at the system in my hand, you can see, you know, I got a big hand, obviously, and uh, it's it's a pretty big machine. So, like I said, I was very surprised when I saw this for the first time. Uh, on the right side, we've got the uh, AC input, 
or DC input. Uh, it runs off 7 volts, I believe. Uh, we have the earphone or the headphone jack. We have the volume jack and the brightness jack for the LCD screen. On the bottom we have a COM port. That's used to link up two of these for multiplayer games. And on the right side we have the adapter for the TV tuner. Just like the Game Gear, this thing had an optional TV tuner that not allowed not only allowed you to watch uh, you know over the air uh, analog television uh, but it also had an AV input the controller layout very similar to the Game Boy like I mentioned um, of course it's the same as a PC uh, engine or TurboGrafx-16 controllers with the turbo options so you have your two-in-one buttons and you have your two-in-one turbo options right on here and then your select and run and uh, overall, it's a very well-built machine. There is one major problem with the machine, and unfortunately, this one is plagued with this problem. Uh, just like the Game Gear, and really a lot of electronics in the early 90s, um, it's plagued with bad capacitors. And just like the Game Gear, it mostly affects the sound system. Um, so the capacitors go bad with age, and the sound doesn't work anymore. So on this one, there's almost n no volume even through the headphones. Through the headphones, very, very low volume. And over the speaker, there's no volume at all. You can turn it all the way up and you won't hear anything. A common issue on here, there's another common issue, and that is with dead pixels. Now, this screen was so advanced for the time that even brand new, these things were known to have one or two dead pixels coming off the production line. So it was a pretty common issue with the screen. It's not a huge deal, but you, it's something you will notice. It's similar to the PSP screens. If you've ever seen the early PSP screens, when they get dead pixels, just very, very, very tiny little uh, red, blue, and, and green dots appear on the screen. Uh, and that's a known issue with this, even back in the day. It's not something that's happened with age. The battery life, obviously, uh, probably even worse than the Game Gear. This one is supposed to get around three hours of battery life off six double A's. So, you know, once again, having that non-color backlit screen on here really helped it in the long run. And, of course, other than that, I mean, it's basically a PC Engine or TurboGrafx-16 inside. It has the same 8-bit processor running at 7.16 megahertz. The same 16-bit, um, you know, dual graphics processors with 512 meg or 512 total color palette. Um, you know, all that is the same. It is essentially a PC Engine on the inside. And uh, well, let's take a look at it and uh, play a game on it, shall we? So let's take a close look at this screen. Give you an idea how clear this thing is. It's literally just pixel perfect. The colors are perfect. And there's absolutely no blurring at all when it moves. I'm hoping if we don't press anything, we'll get a little demo going on here. And I'll be able to hold the screen here. Try and keep it as clear as possible. You actually can hear the sound if you listen very closely. Right now it's turned all the way up, and, you know, if you put your ear up to the speaker, I guess you would hear it. And, uh, you know, like I said, this screen is just amazing. They were not lying uh, when they were boasting, you know, how much better their screen was than the Game Gear and the Lynx. Um, you know, it really is so much better than those screens. Just absolutely no blurring at all in the movement, and, uh, and it picks up the color and the the sharpness just so good um, you know for 1990 I, I couldn't even imagine that they could make LCD screens you know this good in 1990 this is Legendary Axe 2 another great game for the TurboGrafx-16 or PC Engine that I've shown and once again look at the screen look at the blacks I mean it just blows the Game Gear and the Lynx just completely out of the water. It's not just a little bit better. It is just... Look at that. Just no blurring whatsoever with the motion. 
Like I said, there's a few dead pixels there. If you look close enough, you can see them. Looks like two of them are maybe on the same line. You can see just where the mountains are in the background. Two blue or green uh, spots there. But you know, there you go. This screen is just absolutely as crisp as you can imagine. And I, I can't emphasize it enough. If I had saw this in 1990, I would have been totally blown away that they could make a screen this good, you know, back then. So there you go. That's the PC Engine GT or the Turbo Express.